Perfect. So yeah. So yeah. So this is the uh, defense injection uh, uh, presentation. So all my code and slides are there. Uh, if you need it, that's where you'll find it. Um, if you're doing independent injection, you need to look up certain services and stuff like that. You can find them at this address. Um, and also, if you are interested in learning more about dependency injection as well as other development-related stuff, there's a couple podcasts I would recommend. Uh, there's one about talk and called Talking Drupal. It basically talks about all the various changes coming in and going in Drupal. It's really interesting. Then there's a complete developer podcast which goes into a lot of technical stuff, so it's really, really cool. So what are we talking about today? So we're going to basically cover what is dependency injection. Uh, we're going to cover why do we use it, how do we use it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Symfony uh, because Drupal is a Symfony application. And uh, then we're going to talk about how exactly to use uh, dependency injection in Drupal 8. And uh, if time permits, we'll do a demo as well. Okay, so what is dependency injection? To define that, first we gotta look at this, which is basically we need to define what exactly a dependency is. And dependency exists when there's one class that requires another class to do something, right? So if you need something from another class to do your work, then there's a dependency. Uh, and dependency injection, as the name infers, is that it's like we're basically uh, pushing a dependency into an object so that they can use it, right? Um, it's basically, uh, instead of them asking for it during runtime, we're giving, them, giving it to them before they even call the actual function, right? Because you want to build a house, uh, you will want to have all the uh, parts before you build it. Otherwise, if you're building it as you go along, you may need to, uh, it'll be very complicated and it could uh, break things. Dependency injection is also decoupling of objects. So what that means is that um, if you have two objects, one relies on the other, right? Um, but you need to make it so that uh, if uh, that object uh, can be replaced with something else later on, but you can do that, right? And dependency injection allows for that. And we'll see exactly how that's done. So the purpose of dependency injection is to create objects. Its uh, main purpose is to uh, know which classes this object requires, right? And then basically provide those objects with those classes. It's basically a middleman, right? Between your two objects, and it basically asks the one that's requiring something, what exactly are you requiring? Here, I'll give it to you. That's basically what it does, right? You just need to set up a few things and then it basically does it for you. So why do we use dependency injection? Um, we use it because Drupal 8 basically needs it. That's how Drupal 8 works. Uh, if you look at any classes within Drupal 8 or any services, they all use Drupal dependency injection to actually get what they need. Right? If you try to do, uh, do it outside of that, you'll find that uh, uh, you'll, you're running into errors and you can't debug them because you try to find something that the stack trace doesn't show. Uh, also, unlike Drupal 7, where all the code is bootstrapped, in Drupal 8, it's not. You can call the Drupal instance uh, to call a particular uh, function or whatever, but do you really want to bootstrap Drupal? No, you just want to call exactly what you need. So the advantages of using it is that it leads to self-contained code that's easy to unit test. What that means is that basically uh, you're setting up your uh, classes and services. Okay, so before I do that, classes, services, objects, they're exactly the same thing, right? So for now, I'm just gonna say they're services because in Drupal 8's lingo, they're basically all services. Uh, so basically, the advantage of using it is that it leads to self-contained code that's easy to unit test because the service knows exactly what its dependencies are, as, and as soon as you call it, that's exactly what it's going to receive. 
Uh, the code requirements are self-documented because you have a standard structure of uh, required dependencies. When you go to it, you can see exactly what it needs to function. Uh, and it allows for more automation as well because everything is self-contained. Uh, the disadvantages. It's more complex uh, because you kind of have to understand how Drupal's interfaces work and how its services work. So there's a huge, there's a bit of a learning curve. I wouldn't say it's huge, but there is a bit of a learning curve and it can be difficult to debug because if you have a service that depends on another service, that depends on another service, that depends on another service, right? And there's like a, a null happening up top somewhere, you don't exactly know what's causing that. So it's kind of a little bit difficult to debug. So how do we use dependency injection? So as I said, the objects, classes, services, they're all basically all services now, right? Um, and you basically break up your code into separate functions, you know, separate classes to do th separate things, and uh, you call them using services. And we'll look exactly what that is. So just like classes are, oh, sorry, services are basically reusable, they're unit testable and they're self-documented by their nature. Here's an example of a class. Uh, if you're establishing a database connection, you're calling that class uh, database connection. You can also uh, instantiate Drupal to basically call that function to get the connection. And there's a bunch of methods associated with it. What if our services uh, has dependencies. So like if you're calling the database connection and it has a bunch of services, uh, how do we get them and what exactly do we need to uh, recall to uh, show? We could possibly just run this and get the connection, right? But then if you're using this in multiple places, then that's gonna cause a lot of duplications, right? And if, let's say we are not using uh, uh, that connect, get connection anymore, if you're using a completely different data source, for example, that would mean a lot of refactoring. Um, and it, it doesn't really uh, do the decoupling. We could define a global one. Uh, and basically, uh, we start with global uh, variable that basically defines that connection. But then now, anytime that our service needs to be set up, you need to know that you need to set this up. Otherwise, it's going to complain, right? And that's not really documented well. You could just require it as a parameter, right? As an argument, right? Set up a constructor and have it as an argument in there. Now your class will use this connection uh, throughout its uh, execution. And whoever uh, will be using your service knows exactly that you need this. So that's basically Drupal injection, right? Is that basically you're providing the exact uh, requirements for your service to run, right? So the various types of uh, dependency injections are, there's a constructor one which we just looked at. There's also setter injection and property injections. So uh, the setter injections, which are basically optional dependencies, or these are things that need to change within your uh, uh, service. Like let's say you're reusing the service to do multiple things on uh, different uh, uh, entries. So you can set up a setter function that basically sets a uh, local dependency. It could be just a variable or it could be an actual like uh, uh, an actual uh, uh, service as well or a class. Then there's uh, property uh, dependencies. These are things you ex extend, like you're extending another, uh, uh, what do you call it, class or service. So you're inheriting all their functions. Uh, so you can extend them. This is called a property dependency. You could also be implementing uh, other interfaces into yours. So just to recap, uh, services are some code that does something in a class. That's basically what it is. Right? 
dependency injection explicitly requiring any dependencies. So you're basically telling everyone around you that uh, this is what I need to run, and that's what dependency injection does. Again, I'll be showing some code later to uh, show off exactly how that's done. So now let's look at the Symfony connection. Because as you know, Drupal is a Symfony application. Um, and as such, we inherit a lot of the Symfony uh, principles as well. Uh, anytime we're setting up a uh, plugin or a, uh, a any anytime we're setting up a plugin, field, content type, whatever, they're all based on Symfony architecture. Right? As such, they uh, follow the same uh, uh, way that are developed and set up. So, Symfony introduces something called containers uh, into uh, uh, dependency injection. That's something uh, that uh, Symfony provides us. So, a container is basically our dependency injection middleman, right? It basically uh, knows exactly what services are available and will grab them for us and provide it to us. So, here for example, we're saying uh, container equals new container builder. So we're asking this from Symfony, uh, and it will get us the database object. Yeah, so it basically knows exactly what uh, this library is and all the things that it depends on, right? And it will grab that for us and basically give it to us and we can use it for whatever we want in our, um, in our, uh, in our service or class. So ser service containers uh, are basically uh, set up in this manner. And since we're using Drupal, we're going to look at only the YAML format, right? Because in Drupal, uh, services are set up within the services.yaml files. So here's an example of a couple services that have been set up. The first service basically says that uh, we're just going to call the service, and it has service one, um, and this is the class that it uh, calls, right, to get that service. Service two calls this class, but it also takes in an argument, which is service one, right? So it uh, basically depends on service one being there. Yeah, so, so yeah, so basically just building on the previous one, we just have three services here. And uh, services service two and three require on the previous service. Um, and uh, when you say uh, container builder get service three, it will it knows to get service one, two and three. Right when it's actually returning that object, because it, it depends on those, and because the our uh, YAML is set up in that way, it knows exactly what those are as well. And again, we'll look at uh, exactly how this looks like. Then there's also service tags which can apply. Uh, so these tags would allow a container. Yeah, so basically you can tag different services and uh, they can be called by those names as well. So just to recap, uh, services are just some code that does something in a class, right? Classes are services. Dependency injection basically uh, requires any, explicitly requires any dependencies. Uh, service containers are metadata about the services and dependencies, and service tags allow you to name, categorize, and query services. So how does Drupal use dependency injection? Uh, in Drupal 7, all code is bootstrapped, so it's available globally, right? And you use something called hooks to actually, like, uh, 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 to actually, like, respond to events. In Drupal 8, everything is not that way. It's uh, more object-oriented, 
and as such, it imp like you'll implement classes or you'll implement interfaces to react upon different things, right? Um, and uh, so basically, we need to uh, allow for dependency injection to play a role in here. What? So how does that look? Uh, service classes are named this. So you have a module, you have a source directory, and you have a folder inside there. Whatever that folder is, that's your namespace. And then you'll have a class name, uh, .php. Uh, service containers can be defined inside of uh, the my module service.yaml file. Yeah, let's look at some code right now. Any questions so far? Yes. Actually, for the uh, could you go back to the previous slide? It's just for the in terms of best practices. Uh, where do you store your service? Like you, you put like namespace and then name of the service. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here. Yeah. Yes. What's the? I don't know. I, we used to actually just create a service folder and send that in there. Is there any kind of best practice? Or? Uh, best practice is normally that uh, so everything's going to be inside your module, right? So these services are local to your module, right? So technically, you call us anything you want. You can call services. I call it custom services, but I was going to say most of the modules in Drupal Core that offer services don't actually like stick them in subfolders, anyways. Yeah, they just leave it in the module name, name, like namespace at the root. So I don't I. I don't know if there is a best practice. Yeah, I don't know. I, I put them in separate folks, yeah, but yeah. again, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So there, I guess there is no real best practice, but uh, it's just that uh, your module is going to be part of the namespace anyways, yeah. right? So it really doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as your module name is unique, I guess that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. yeah unless it's like, what? So that is super important. Yeah, exactly. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So let's just dive into some code. Uh, Try small. Is that visible? Yeah. Okay, so here I just have a custom module that I've set up. Um, it just uh, sets up a service uh, which is called uh, custom. It, I'm basically calling it a custom service. It's a script subscriber mail. Um, I worked on a mailing thing. I just stripped out a lot of stuff from this. But basically, what's going? Well, it's a little dim. But basically, what's going on here is that uh, I'm basically creating a new service within Drupal. Um, and I'm um, calling it uh, mailer.subscribermail uh, and it's basically referencing this class, right? First thing always is you have Drupal, then you have the name your module, then you have your namespace, and then you have the actual service. Um, and it accepts two arguments. One is entity type manager, and one is entity repository. Um, well, I'll show you exactly what those do. So here I have my service, I have my custom service I've set up. It's inside, it's hard to see it, but it's inside a custom services directory within the source. Um, and it basically says uh, that uh, I want to place all the stuff within this namespace, right? So anything that's using the same namespace uh, can reference me, right? Um, and then it's using a whole bunch of uh, dependencies. But uh, I'll just, so we have a class subscriber mail, and inside of it we have a whole bunch of protective functions, which I forgot to delete. Um, and then we have a constructor. So the constructor is basically saying that we need two uh, uh, we need two parameters passed into us in order for us to work. It's basically saying that, listen, we need the config factory and we need entity type uh, manager interface to do some work later on. 
Uh, so we're basically setting them up as local variables within this uh, uh, class, and uh, it, so that we can use it wherever we need it. Um, that way we don't have to reinstantiate the, that uh, in class, and uh, it also speeds up and uh, reduces memory usage as well. Um, then we have a create function. Now create function actually grabs us uh, that particular uh, uh, that particular dependency. Uh, this is using a uh, container interface, which is coming from Symfony. Um, and we can uh, see that up here that uh, container interface is coming from Symfony. It's a Symfony component, dependency injection. Um, and uh, basically, it, it knows exactly where all our services are because we set them up through the services.yaml file, right? And it uh, basically can grab us exactly what those uh, uh, entities are. As to why config.factory is being used, uh, so these uh, names identify uh, each of those uh, um, parameters. Now, they vary depending on, yes? Uh, sorry, are these the two arguments you passed in the services.yaml? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're exactly the same uh, uh, wording as well, and they come from. Uh, sorry. On Drupal.org, there's a, a Drupal API. So here, if you need to look up any particular service within Drupal, um, you can do that here. So if you're if you wanted the config factory, for example, you can type in config, and it'll give us a whole bunch of uh, items, and here's config factory, right? That's the name that we applied to this, right? Because we want, okay, before I even went on to explain the actual class, I should have explained what the class does. Um, so, uh, this class was set up to like uh, basically send a test email, right? Um, and it was going to load some configuration to uh, get some presets like uh, uh, the sender name, sender email, and uh, some other uh, arbitrary items. And then it was going to do was it was going to look up uh, the latest uh, content that's on the site and basically attach it to the email to be sent out. So I figured that I need at least two dependencies for this, right? One was the config factory, which handles all the um, uh, all the configuration, and the other one was the entity type manager, which actually lets me load content, right? This lets me actually grab content. Uh, so I started uh, basically building my uh, class up this way, uh, and. Uh, uh, I passed in those two variables, and then I had to set up a create function. Now, create is very important because uh, it lets us actually pass those uh, objects into our class. Services will tell us exactly what those parameters are, but it won't tell us exactly. Um, uh, it's not actually. It's passing it in, but it's, uh, this is telling us that this is exactly what we need to pass in. Um, this comes. Uh, this is important when it comes to unit testing, right? Because so for unit testing, it's not going to bootstrap Drupal or anything like that. It's going to basically call our class, and the class will be able to create these variables um, uh, for us, and that way we don't have to do a lot of lookups. Uh, and in here, I also have a node interface, which I'm basically passing in from the previous one. Uh, actually, that's wrong. <laughs> I forgot to leave that. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so going back, uh, so ex how exactly do you look up what exactly you need to uh, uh, put inside your constructor? I knew that I needed to look up, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the config. So I looked up config and I went through and found that. Uh, the one thing that uh, everything uses is config factory. That's the main interface uh, to basically uh, uh, look up any service within uh, any configuration within Drupal. So I can see here that uh, this is 
the American Fig Factory is located. So I would include that. I would use this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, I would use that as part of my code. So up top, I would set up the Drupal Core Config, config Factory. All right, that's the class I'm using here. And then I would say that in my constructor, that uh, I, this is of type config factory. I just called it config factory, just for naming sake. Then I also set, set up a protected function within my class called config factory. You can call this anything you want. Uh, well, not everything, but uh, you should make it specific to what you're actually looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically how that is passed in. Same thing with any type manager interface. Um, you can just look that up on the API page and it'll add it there. Now, exactly how do you use this? Uh, so, anywhere within your function, within your service, uh, you can have a, uh, any, you can call that function like uh, using this and then the actual uh, variable, and then you can actually call whatever function on that uh, interface that uh, you wish. So here I'm calling get the uh, storage node, and I'm loading the campaign ID that uh, uh, we got passed in. Um, yeah, so this is just doing config factory lookups. Uh, now, you can, Now, dependency injection works for uh, classes. Uh, you, in regards to mod, like module files, uh, because there's no class, there's no construct, right? You can't really call the service uh, that way. Uh, so one way you can do that is uh, uh, by basically uh, calling Drupal to grab that service. Right, and if you grab that service, because all the uh, procedures are already set up, you don't need to pass in any parameters, right? Because it already knows exactly what it needs, um, and then of course you can just uh, 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 basically use it uh, by uh, calling various functions. And so I have a setter function within it to basically set the node ID that I want to start using for this. And then I have a generate mail function, which uh, basically generates mail for me. Um, you can also, um, so I also have another function here, another service here called uh, uh, send mail. This is another class that I set up to basically uh, use my newly created service uh, a subscriber mail uh, to basically send uh, emails because all that does right now is that it just sets up a class that can basically generate mail and send it out but it doesn't really know exactly what it needs to be sending out that has to be done outside uh, so I set up a, a class that basically extends the control base right uh, control base uh, basically lets me uh, set up a route to any specific point uh, which I can execute a whole bunch of code, right? Um, and this is basically a, a uh, property uh, injection, right? Because basically we're extending control base, so we're basically inheriting all the control base uh, uh, functionality. Um, and, uh, oh, I almost forgot. So, one thing that uh, Drupal does a little bit different is uh, translations. So if you're using translations within Drupal, uh, you have to basically set up a uh, string translation trait. Uh, you have to use that class. Um, and uh, within your class, you actually have to use a string translation trait. Uh, this tells us, uh, this is a little bit different than most other things, and I find it a little weird. Uh, but uh, because you're not really putting this inside this uh, construct or you're not actually like injecting it somewhere, you're just saying, I just want to use this trait. And uh, what this will let us do is this will let us use this key. If you know the key function from Drupal, 
right? That also translates strengths. Well, if you want to do that inside your uh, services or inside your classes, uh, then depends on the injection, this is the way you do it, right? T is being de deprecated for Drupal 9, so this is really how you have to do it. Um, yeah. So going back to this class here, uh, so I set up this class which is send mail. It extends the control base. What this class does is that it basically uh, accepts a bunch of parameters and then it says, okay, I'm going to call the subscriber mail class and I'm going to uh, generate emails for particular uh, node IDs and send them out. That's all I'm going to be doing. Uh, so I set up a controller which is going to be executed through a route um, and it basically accepts two parameters. One is the subscriber mail and the other one is a messenger. Messenger, uh, for those that don't know, is basically how you set up uh, status messages within Drupal. Right? So if you want to set up a status message, error message, or info message, whatever, that's how you do it. Right? You do it through the messenger interface. Um, and uh, then I've, again, I created a create function for it uh, to basically pass those in. Um, for custom services like this, you can just use your uh, mailer dot, which is the um, service I set up. Where's my service? Mailer dot subscriber mail, right? That's how you get that name because that's the service I've set up. Uh, then, of course, I'm passing in Messenger, which it knows about from Drupal itself. Then I have a function here, which is send test mail, and it basically uh, receives a uh, node uh, interface a parameter. This is uh, uh, being passed in from my uh, outside uh, function, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and it basically does a bunch of things, like it calls the subscribe and calls the uh, mailer uh, that I've just set up, and sets the campaign to be the current node and language, and basically says, okay, generate some mail, and then once it's once it's done generating the mail, it sets a status, and this is where you use this T, right? Because we set up the trait already, and uh, it basically sets the st status. Um, and then does a bunch of things in regards to loading the campaign, setting, updating the last uh, test run, and saves it. Uh, did I pass any yeah. No, I did not. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I forgot to pass in one. <laughs> uh, one uh, interface into, into my constructor, uh, which is the entity manager. And so I'll just do that right now. Copy one of these. If you guys have any questions, just ask. Uh, if I'm confusing anyone, I'd like to clarify things. Yeah, so this is my self-documenting thing going on here, so everyone knows exactly what each one does. And then, of course, uh, in here we'll just do container uh, get. And I don't know exactly what it is, so I'll just look it up. And just do entity 
manager. Yeah. It is called NTD manager. Is it NTD manager or NTD type? Uh, it is NTD manager. That's Oh, is it? Yeah, you Oh, yeah, you're right. Shoot. <laughs> you're stunning in point two dots. Oh, I did use that anyway. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, uppercase T. Uppercase T? Oh, no, never mind. Sorry, you're typing in the set. So yeah. Okay, so that basically adds Hannity Manager to our... Line 38. What? On line 38, you have the wrong project. Yes, you're right. Okay. okay. So there we have Hannity Manager, and I think I'm using, yeah, using Hannity Manager to basically load that particular node and uh, um, getting a translation of that and then doing some functions. Uh, so at the bottom here, I'm uh, calling URL from route. Uh, since I'm not, I'm calling this statically, um, I guess I could have injected this, but I didn't. Um, but uh, I'm not using it, I wasn't planning on using it anywhere else, so I think it's fine for that. Uh, okay, so then we have the uh, the functionality above this. It's actually calling that uh, send uh, mail uh, class. And this basically is just using hook cron, which we all use. Um, and uh, it's saying, that, okay, uh, get me some campaigns to run, uh, then we have a campaign runner which calls a service and then basically goes through and set, uh, runs that uh, service. Um, so this is how you kind of do it inside your uh, .module file, right? Um, and uh, you could also use, uh, do a use statement up here. So you could do use um, triple Mailer uh, custom services and then subscribe mail uh, to do that. But if you do that, then you also need to do pass in all the uh, uh, dependencies into it, which uh, if you call the class specifically, uh, you'll have to do. Um, but if you just call the services here, then basically it injects all those services for you. Um, yeah, I just hard coded a bunch of random values down here. I'm not going to run this because I don't have a working site, but uh, everything uh, has been committed and pushed up. Uh, anyone have, have any questions? Um, anything I'm confused about? You know, some confused faces? Yeah. yeah, you were talking previously about uh, the trade for translation. Yes. Uh, I, I remember that uh, what I did uh, in the code uh, recently, I did the injection for that. I didn't know there was a trade. So is there a page where it lists all the trades? And I actually found out some days that there's a trade, so maybe you can tell me. <laughs> So for to like get the T function, there's, it's documented somewhere in the, the Drupal 8 documentation that to get like T and support translation in classes, um, the correct way is to use the, the string translation tray. But there's other la like language features. Like if you actually want to interact with languages and translate things, like content stuff, then you, there are services that you need for those. Um, there are traits in the API docs, but Unfortunately, with most things in Drupal 8, you kind of have to read Drupal 8's course, like the source in Drupal 8 core, and look at how they're doing things, and then mm -hmm. learn all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, um, yeah, when you're actually using a lot of this, uh, 
The reason it gets complicated is because a lot of stuff isn't well documented. And uh, you kind of have to go through the core source to actually find examples of some of the uh, dependency requirements. Um, so I would, yeah, you kind of have to dig through code to get that as well. But uh, if everything you're looking for is available in the uh, API docs, then that's where you look. But then again, like even that, like searching is very in, not very good uh, because. How do I know that I need to fix that if I'm looking at configuration? I mean, I may have to go through every single config uh, API mentioned in order for me to find that, right? And that's basically, well, I, what I did initially was go to the uh, core source and I found like, oh, we're going to be using config factory. So uh, it is a little confusing and a little bit complicated in the beginning, but uh, once you start using it, then it gets easier and easier. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, can you talk a little, about, a little bit about interfaces? And they seem to be like... Yes, so interfaces are interesting because in, uh, if you're setting up services, you kind of want to use an interface, right? To basically uh, interface around it. Uh, and uh, the way they work is that basically your, uh, your service will call, will reference a uh, we'll, no, we'll ask for a dependency injection of an interface. Um, and the reason you want that is because uh, that is what allows for your code to be decoupled. Right? Uh, it needs, uh, an interface basically allows you to implement multiple classes to represent it. Right? It works like a middleman between multiple classes that do, that do similar things but might do it with different things. Right? For example, database. You could have a MySQL database, you could have a Postgres database, you could have a flat hierarchy, right? Uh, all that sort of stuff um, uh, would uh, basically use the same interface to talk to all your things, right? Um, and uh, in that way, basically, if you need to change your functionality later on, you're not rewriting your, uh, uh, your, your main service. Instead, you just basically change the dependency on it. Um, and, uh, hmm. Do I have an example? I don't have an example right now. Yeah, yeah. I think it's like a best practice, but it is best practice. I don't find myself writing them very often, and I don't think you had one there. No, and I haven't. I, it is best practice, but. Uh, I also don't write it, so. Um, because all, every time I need to do something custom, it's basically put something specific. But then again, I mean, later on, that, uh, uh, if someone needs to, act, to change it and find something else, maybe someone else could also have better uh, mailing, app, mailing class, then they have to go back and like, change a lot of stuff in life. Um, yeah, because we should make our code so that it's not dependent on the dependency. It requires it, but it doesn't care exactly how that code gets executed, right? Yeah, it's like um, an abstraction. Yeah, it's an abstraction, exactly. Um, so that's the way basically we should do it. Uh, it is difficult, uh, but that's how it should be done. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you.